Okay, so good morning, guys. Sorry for the, the delay. Uh, today, what we're hoping I can get covered is the phenolic section. It may get cut off, and we may have to continue it next week. Um, but this is uh, a large group of compounds. And a quick overview, there are different categories we'll talk about. So you've probably heard of things like flavonoids before. Uh, they're a type of, flav uh, type of phenolic compound. Uh, you may have heard of things called polyphenols. These are also phenolic compounds. And so a lot of the health benefits in a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, um, the antioxidants associated with them are often phenolic compounds. And so we'll go through and give you a bunch of different classes of these and explain uh, some of the differences. Now, to start off with, uh, phenol compounds are defined as having a phenol ring. And so what a phenol ring is, um, it's a six-membered aromatic ring with an OH group attached. So benzene is what it is without the OH, and phenol is the basic, uh, you know, six-membered ring with the OH there. And there's a few different types of phenols, basic phenols. There's a catechol. So this is where you have two OH groups side by side. That's also a phenolic compound. Or you can have hydroquinone, which has the OH groups directly across from each other. And both of these uh, compounds have importance later on that we'll talk about. As an aside, when we're talking about catecholamines, there are neurotransmitters in your body that have this basic catechol group, like dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. So they're referred to as catecholamines. They're technically both a phenolic compound and an amino acid neurotransmitter derivative. So they're um, sometimes they're fall under the category of uh, alkaloids, although they're not technically an alkaloid because they have nitrogens. Um, so in general, if we're going to talk about phenolic compounds. In nature, uh, they usually don't exist as phenol because it will evaporate away that in that sort of form. But a phenol or a phenolic compound, um, because they have that OH group on that aromatic ring, it's able to accept and donate electrons along the ring structure. And so one of the ways uh, that phenolic compounds function is they act as antioxidants. Now, antioxidants are both able to accept and donate electrons. So when you hear the term antioxidant, it's not entirely... Uh, accurate because if it's an antioxidant, chances are it can also act as a pro-oxidant. So it can accept free radicals, but it can also create free radicals as well under certain circumstances. So phenol compounds are able to accept a single electron and sequester it along their air, along the ring. That's kind of what gives them a unique property. So anything that has a phenol ring structure is going to act as an antioxidant to some degree. Um, these also, or many of these guys, will have some anti-inflammatory properties. If you remember looking at things like salicylic acid, um, there are OH groups on its ring structure that allows it to fit into certain enzymes involved with inflammation. And so most antioxidants, uh, most of these uh, phenolic compounds will act as anti-inflammatory. So when you think of things like ginger, turmeric, uh, salicylic acid, those are just a few that come to mind that have potent uh, anti-inflammatory properties. And in general, if you can decrease inflammation in the body, often that'll have an anti-cancer effect as well, uh, indirectly, but also directly. Some of these will attach to certain receptors on cells to induce apoptosis in these cancer cells. So things like turmeric, um, contains curcumin, the active ingredient we'll talk about later, and it's often considered a potent uh, anti-cancer compound. And finally, a lot of these compounds uh, presumably are created by the plants to help them fight off infections of some sort. So maybe they'll have antifungal properties, so the plant produces it to uh, protect them from uh, microorganisms like funguses or bacteria. So. In general, when it comes to uh, indications of these phenols, I would say 
Some of these in your diet are going to act as dietary antioxidants and help to prevent uh, degener degenerative diseases. So things like heart disease uh, probably have some role in Alzheimer's, uh, also help prevent cancer, uh, can improve uh, some symptoms of arthritis by decreasing inflammation, and they can also be used for infections, okay? So they are ubiquitous in nature, meaning they're pretty much everywhere, and plants are rich sources of these. And one of the benefits of having a plant-rich diet is whole foods plant-rich diet is you're going to have a lot of these phenolic compounds and these phenolic compounds would be considered non-essential nutrients uh, that prevent heart disease, cancer, diabetes. But again, it's not the only thing that's important in your plant-based diet. You also have carotenoids. You're going to have some of those other terpenoids we discussed. But certainly these phenolic compounds um, are part of the team of things that help prevent disease. Okay. And as I mentioned before, these can readily accept and donate electrons, which can make them both an antioxidant, but also you have to be careful because they can make things a pro-oxidant as well. And that just means that high dose of certain antioxidants could have a negative effect if supplemented alone. Rarely do you see that dietary antioxidants, rarely if ever do you see that their dietary antioxidants pose any real serious threat to health. But we know that supplementing with a single antioxidant in really high amounts um, has not always shown to be beneficial and often has negative effects depending on the dose. Okay. So to start off with, we'll begin with the simplest uh, phenols, things like hydroquinone, for example. Now, there is a herb and so when I'm going through these, I'm going to talk about the herbs and use them as an example of a source of these compounds. There's a herb in um, botanical medicine called bearberry that's common, commonly used for urinary tract infections. And so its actions is it's usually called the urinary astringent. We'll talk about astringency later on um, in more detail. But what astringent things are is a... Um, they have the ability to tan mucous membranes, so um, they can affect the, the, the structure of them. Um, it's also called a urinary antiseptic, and that's the big one. So a ur urinary antiseptic basically means it helps to decrease the growth of microorganisms in the urinary tract. So in general, it has an antimicrobial effect, and specifically it's a urinary antiseptic, okay? So the classic herb bearberry contains it. There are other herbs that contain uh, a very similar type of compound, and that compound is called hydroquinone, uh, a glycoside of hydroquinone. The name of that is arbutin. Now, if you look here on the left hand side, what you basically have in the purple is the hydroquinone, and attached is in black here is the sugar. And so, the reason why the plant attaches a sugar molecule to it is it basically uh, allows it to make it water soluble. And also probably to keep it from evaporating away or, or disappearing because uh, the hydroquinone structure, it does a couple of things. One, because it's relatively small, it's probably going to be pretty reactive. And it's also, I suspect, it's going to be able to diffuse through cell membranes and, and uh, get away from them. Um, so by adding the sugar, you're going to help to uh, control that hydroquinone molecule uh, a lot better. The other thing is because you've attached the sugar to the OH group on there, that means it's going to, on some level, make it less reactive. Um, so it's not going to be able to accept and donate electrons as readily as it would if it exists, exists as free hydroquinone. So in the plants, it exists as arbutin. And what can happen, like any glycoside, is you can perform hydrolysis on it to cleave off that sugar. So there's a couple ways you can perform hydrolysis. One, uh, if you were to consume arbutin orally, in your stomach, the stomach acid is going to cleave off that sugar molecule and liberate the hydroquinone molecule. So consuming uh, arbutin on a daily basis in high amounts, uh, to me, may not be a great thing because hydroquinone in free form 
acts as a bleaching agent, okay? Um, it can basically become oxidized and uh, as a result generate free radicals that have a bleaching action. So here's an example of, it's not really, I mean, it'll, it'll act as an antioxidant to some degree, but it's mostly going to have uh, a negative effect where it's going to create some free radicals. And also in that hydroquinone form, it's going to act, uh, it's going to disrupt cell membranes because cell membranes are kind of uh, vulnerable to uh, essential oils and these small, um, these small little compounds like this. So in your stomach, it gets liberated to some degree. Um, but another way it can be liberated is by an enzyme called beta -gluco glucoxidase. And a lot of bacteria that cause urinary tract infections have this enzyme. And so what this enzyme allows them to do is cleave off a sugar molecule and they can then consume it as a fuel source. Now, when I look at arbutin, to me it looks... From a herbal standpoint, it's kind of like a, a mouse trap where it's been baited with food. So you've got a mouse trap, and basically the trap is the hydroquinone, but the bait is the sugar molecule. And so when this molecule passes into the urinary tract, the arbutin molecule is attractive to these bacteria that have the beta glucoxidase enzyme. They basically eat off the sugar, and then the hydroquinone gets released that then has an antiseptic effect. It doesn't have an antibiotic effect per se because it doesn't target a specific enzyme. Rather, it just sort of disrupts the cell membranes, causing issues that way. So that's how a lot of plants um, will use these glycosides to their advantage. Uh, kind of keeps them temporarily inactive, makes them water soluble, and in this case, the bacteria. Uh, it gets delivered to the bacteria relatively intact. You will get some of it being liberated in the stomach, uh, but for the most part, it gets into the GI, uh, urinary tract and exerting its influence there. Now, just as an aside, there have been reports in animals, if, when given arbutin or uh, even bearberry, the, the actual herb, but probably arbutin in high amounts, was shown to increase the risk of cancer in the stomach to some degree. Uh, I don't know if that's clinically significant or not, but I wouldn't use this herb. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for people to drink as a tea on a daily basis because that slightly increases the risk of cancer. Um, unlike chamomile tea, which I would tell people to drink every day. So to me, arbutin, which is found in the bearberry, bearberry tree is something you probably would be wise to limit to short periods of time for weeks. Uh, I'm sure even months would be fine, uh, but I wouldn't want people to consume this on a daily basis long term. Okay. And that's because it can increase the risk of cancer, certain types of cancers. Now to put it in perspective, lots of things increase the risk of cancer. Uh, processed meats certainly do. Uh, so I don't know how it would compare to smoking a cigarette or having uh, a piece of salami, maybe it's uh, comparable to, to that, but it's worth sort of noting that. Now, no human trials have shown it increases the risk of cancer, but that may just be because of insufficient evidence, okay? Uh, someone's asked me, phenol is a ring without sugar? Yes, the phenol is just, it's basically six carbons with an OH group attached to it, and it's all aromatic. So someone's asking, so how does it treat urinary tract infections if the bacteria can use the upright you know, fuel by using the beta glucoxidase? As I mentioned, the sugar may be a fuel, just like when you have a mouse trap, uh, cheese or peanut butter might be uh, fuel, but the arbutin, when it becomes liberated, will disrupt the cell membrane of these bacteria and can cause uh, cell lysis, like breaking up of the cell, okay? And that's because it basically... Uh, releases free radicals and also dis disrupts the cell membrane itself, okay? So now we're going to talk about phenolic acids. And these are some of the, um, there's different phenolic acids that exist. Some of these are very small, some of them are longer in size, okay? Um, and this is a quick little breakdown of some examples of phenolic acids. 
what a phenolic acid is, is you basically have um, benzoic acid. You may have seen this compound before. This, technically speaking, is not a phenolic acid because it lacks the phenol group. But this is what the acid we're talking about here. We're talking about a benzene ring with basically a carboxylic acid. So this compound here that I've highlighted in blue, this is the acid component of it. And this is what causes it, cause, um, why salicylic acid is the, the simplest of the phenolic acids, okay? Because you've got your phenol group and you've got this CO2, uh, CO2 group here. Now, benzoic acid is a preservative. If you've ever had certain orange juice, apple juices, when I was a kid, they used to come in plastic containers with a foil lid to it, and it always had this weird metallic -y, tangy taste to it. That's the benzoic acid. It's a preservative. It does exist in nature. It is a natural preservative, uh, but I don't particularly like the taste of it. So the two simple phenolic acids are salicylic acid, and this is uh, the cousin of acetyl salicylic acid, which is what aspirin is. Uh, acetyl salicylic acid has an acetyl group attached to the phenol group right here. Um, so you've got the simple phenol group with that carboxylic acid to it. That's the basic one. There's another important compound called gallic acid, and it is also a phenolic acid. So in this case, you've got three OH groups attached to the benzene ring, and then you've got a carboxylic acid. And this gallic acid is a really port, important part of uh, hydrolyzable tannins, okay? So certain things that are very stringent in nature have this gallic acid with sugars attached to it. We'll talk about it in a sec, okay? So a simple phenolic acid, you've got two examples. It's basically uh, the salicylic acid, which is an anti-inflammatory found in little bark, amongst other things. And also gallic acid, which is found in high amounts in oak and other astringent herbs. Now, there is another important compound called elagic acid. Now, elagic acid is basically two gallic acid molecules stuck together. And elagic acid is found in lots of different uh, fruits and vegetables and herbs. Pomegranate contains elagic acid. And I think pomegranate has a number of things in it that helps, um, that has an antioxidant effect. It has the red color, which we'll talk about later on, which are called anthocyanins. And then there's some of these stringent compounds like elagic acid found in pomegranate, but it's also found in certain berries like raspberries. So there are lots of health benefits associated with this compound. I think it's probably a little bit more, um, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, probably similar to gallic acid, but once you create two of these, you stick two gallic acid molecules together, it will behave a little bit differently. So this has antioxidant effects because it's a phenolic compound, has anti-cancer effects. You can probably deduce that because it has um, this structure as well. I Presumably it has some anti-inflammatory effects, although uh, I haven't looked that up per se, but I wouldn't be surprised. And then it also has that astringent effect. Astringency, if you're wondering, um, what that is, when you bite into a green banana and your mouth puckers up, or you have a red wine that's uh, been aged in oak barrels, and it's very, very astringent, your mouth kind of puckers up, uh, basically what it is, is it's, it's tanning your mucous membranes. So it's converting those mucous membranes into a, a thicker tissue, uh, like leather, okay? And that's what you use... Um, tanning agents to do is to basically tan the hides of animals to make leather, okay? And so in small amounts, tannins have some positive effects on health. If you took really high amounts of tannins, even if you just drink a lot of oaky red wine on an empty stomach, it'll give you gut rot and it'll start to change and denature some of the proteins in your, in your gut, some of those transporters and stuff and not make you feel very good. Uh, and that's why presumably uh, people will often consume things like red wine with steak. So those tannins in the uh, oaky wines bind to the proteins in the meat rather than your intestinal tract to kind of have a bit of a neutralizing effect. Or people will often take a little bit of milk, which contains protein, and add it to their tea 
to make it less astringent as well, because black tea also has uh, astringent compounds in it, okay? Any questions on that? So the next thing we're going to talk about are a group of compounds called phenylpropanoids. <clears throat> phenylpropanoids uh, are the building block for a large class of compounds. Okay, You may have heard of coumarins before, you may have heard of flavonoids, you may have heard of anth anthocyanidins, you may have heard of uh, lignans, spilbinoids. These are all derived from phenylpropanoids. So phenylpropanoids are the building blocks to make these compounds. And what makes them, to break down the name, in chemistry, propane, like propane gas, is made up of three carbons, okay? And that's the definition of propane. You've got three carbons. Phenyl is related to phenol, like phenolic. And so you basically have that aromatic ring. And if it's... Uh, you got this little benzene ring here. Then you've got so phenyl phenylalanine is this, an amino acid that has the phenyl group, not not uh, uh, phenol, but phenyl, with these uh, three carbon side chain. In this case, there's a carboxylic acid here, and in this case, there is an amine group. So this is an amino acid. Once you cleave off that amine group, you have a phenylpropanoid. Okay. So they typically are made from either uh, the amino acids, phenylalanine or tyrosine, okay? And they can be the building blocks to make all these other phytochemicals. So phenylalanine and tyrosine make phenylpropanoids. These go on to make hydroxycinamic acids. They go off to make these different compounds, either coumarins, phenylpropene, which are a type of amino acids, or a bunch of other polyphenols over here, okay? So the simplest class of phenylpropanoids are the phenylpropenes. So remember when we talked about uh, monoterpenes and the monoterpenes being uh, part of essential oils? And so essential oils are usually going to consist of either monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, like those two main types, also diterpenes to some degree, um, or from ones like phenylpropenes, okay? So monoterpenes and phenylpropenes are structurally almost identical. They, if you started to count up the count, if you count up the carbons on the monoterpenes, you'll get 10 carbons, remember? Two isoprene units, so two times five carbons equals 10 carbons. Okay, that's how you come up with the monoterpenes. The phenylpropenes, you start off by having a six-membered ring with three amino acids, or sorry, three carbons attached to it, derived from those amino acids, okay? And so in this case, this compound has nine carbons, plus they've gone and stuck another one at the end there to make it 10 carbons. So this one has 10 carbons, but technically speaking, it was built with only nine carbons. And so phenylpropenes generally consist of nine carbons on the ring or the side chain, and then they may add some more carbons onto the OH groups on the sides, okay? So this is an aromatic compound, and the reason why it's aromatic is you have these conjugated double bonds. If you remember from organic chemistry, uh, conjugated double bonds means you've got space, double bond, space, double bond, space, double bond, space, double bond. And so when you draw it, it's drawn in this static form, but in real life, those double bonds form a halo of electrons and they join up together and they jump around. So it doesn't actually exist in this way. Just like if you're trying to draw um, uh, our solar system, you might draw Mars and Jupiter and everything uh, being static, but in actual fact, they're, they're floating around and moving around, orbiting around each other, okay? So phenylpropenes, they're derived from the amino acid, phenylalanine, or sometimes tyrosine, um, and they're a really important constituent in essential oils. There are a lot of the herbs in your spice cabinet that are comprised of these phenylpropenes. So certain things like peppermint are made from monoterpenes, like peppermint oil comes from monoterpenes, uh, oregano oil comes from the monoterpenes, but 
Lots of other herbs, in particular certain ones that belong to the Apiaceae family or the carrot family, um, which includes celery, anise, fennel, um, contain these guys, cumin as well. And so a lot of the seeds, little tiny seeds that you see in your culinary uh, uh, spice jars will be will contain these phenylpropions, okay? And so they act just like the other I mean, uh, other um, um, essential oils are going to act as antimicrobials. They're going to also have a digestive effect called carminative where they help to uh, promote digestion and relieve gas, okay? So lots of different herbs have these in it. So here on the left-hand side is uh, the fennel plant and both the uh, root or the bulb and the uh, stalk of the fennel plants consumed like a vegetable and then the seeds from the plant uh, is used medicinally uh, for a number of things. Okay. Uh, so, what else do we have here? So, in general, these compounds are relatively safe, but there are certain uh, phenylpropenes that are considered hepatotoxic. And so, what happens is sometimes when these are consumed, there are certain ones that, because of their structure, they can be activated by the liver uh, to become uh, toxic, okay? And so, what I've observed, the pattern that I've seen is when that double bond on the side chain here, so this is a three carbon side chain, that double bond that's in the middle, it seems to be relatively safe and you don't seem to get the liver cancer associated with anthol. But if the double bond is at, like, at the, uh, the very end or uh, there's a, a terminal double bond here, um, this compound here when it's basically metabolized by the liver, it forms a free radical that then can attack the liver. And so normally what happens during phase one detox is that the P450 enzymes in the liver will oxidize or reduce some compounds. And in this case, these will generate free radicals and can damage the liver. So things like clove oil or saffron, now, saffron was once in, uh, comes from a plant called sassafras. You can find sassafras trees growing in uh, Hyde Park. I don't know if I have a picture of it. Um, when you crush the leaves up, it's in, it's, uh, when you crush the leaves up, it has a very aromatic smell to it. And they used to make root beer from it uh, until they realized that uh, it caused cancer. So you're no longer allowed to use saffron uh, oil or sassafras oil in, um, in, uh, by the food industry. So the FDA and Health Canada sort of banned that. Uh, but other things like basil, which we know basil uh, is consumed by a lot of people, potentially in high amounts, this essential oil could also cause cancer. Now, I suspect that when you're consuming things like basil or um, clove or cinnamon and, and other types of spices, that there are other compounds in the food that you're eating that help to neutralize some of the negative effects of these things. And when you took it in isolation, like you took a, a bottle of clove oil uh, and if you drank like five mils of it, that might actually cause liver failure because uh, it's too much of this oogenol. Clove oil is, you can buy it, it used to be used by dentists uh, as an analgesic, a top of analgesic or anodyne. You apply it to your teeth and it numbs the area. Um, but if a child were to accidentally consume it, you could get into trouble there. Um, one other interesting thing is nutmeg. Um, this particular herb contains myristicin. And nutmeg is known if you, if you were to take the powder and grind it up and snort it, it can cause some hallucinations. And it's known that this structure can bind to certain dopamine structures in the body and have hallucinogenic effects. Um, I've never actually done that. I don't think I have any desire to, uh, but there are herbs used or sometimes um, there are certain herbs that have that history uh, and people have consumed it and, and deliberately or undeliberately to get that 
and I have, have experienced that effect. So, uh, so someone's a couple questions. People want to know about: Do we have to memorize? Do we need to memorize? Know all the actions, the examples on this slide? No. So I wouldn't ask you to know that anethol is a carminative and don't even, you don't have to worry about that. Those are just for your sake. I think if you know that these are all phenylpropenes and that uh, some phenylpropenes are, are uh, hepatotoxic, a lot of these phenylpropenes are found in essential oils. Oils, uh, I think that's kind of what I'm looking for. Also, if I were to, like on an exam, what I might say is anethol, which is found in anise, is uh, rich in which of the class of compounds? Is it A, phenylpropenes, B, carotenoids, C, like I might say something like that, okay? Uh, and you don't have to know the chemical structure on the exam. What, what you probably want to know for the exam is knowing that phenylpropenes have that phenol ring with three carbon side chain, but I'm not going to ask you to say, you know, look at this structure and know that it's anethyl. You know, it's just in general knowing patterns to it. I'm not going to go into a lot of specifics on it. So you don't have to, it's just in general, you have to know the basic sort of structure. So uh, you might, I might ask a question like, um, there is a 10 carbon compound found in an essential oil. Is it A, monoterpenes, B, sesquiterpenes, C, uh, triterpenes, uh, that might be a fair question. I think I want you to know that phenylpropenes are different than monoterpenes, but they're both found in essential oils. I think that's something I want you to know as well. Um, but I'm not going to go into a lot of details. And I'll post, I've already posted some sample questions. Those give you an idea of what to expect for exam questions. I'm really not try expecting you guys to remember everything. I may use a question like, Anise, phenyl, clove, and nutmeg all contain high amounts of which of the following compounds? A, phenylpropenes, B, uh, curcuminoids, D, anthocyanidins. Like, I think that would be fair. And I'm not just, usually I try to give you a few examples. Uh, so if you forgot what phenyl was, you might go, yeah, I remember anise, and I remember clove, and I remember cinnamon all have a rich in essential oil, and they have these things. I don't think exams. Uh, it's not, I'm not trying to make it difficult. There's a lot of information, but I'm not trying to make it difficult, okay? Uh, someone's asking, would these effects be true if you cook them? Um, appreciate if you're cooking, let's say, fennel, the plant like this, I guess this is a bulb, it's not, I don't think it's real, I think it's a bulb. Um, there are still significant amounts of anethol in it. So it might promote digestion, even if you're eating a few pieces of this, but it's dose dependent. So having a tablespoon or a teaspoon of the seeds would have a lot more of the essential oils in it than having the equivalent volume of the vegetable itself, okay? So um, when you cook it, you will get some evaporation, but the boiling point for most essential oils is going to be above 300 degrees. So um, if it's in the oven, you know, at 350 degrees, but whatever you're cooking it in has water and the water won't allow it to exceed about 100 degrees until it evaporates away. There will be some that's still trapped in there and some that will evaporate. So, uh, you know, if you're boiling, making tea with this, uh, with the seeds, you will have a certain amount of it will evaporate off, but relatively small amounts if you're just making tea. If you boil it on the stove for hours or cook it in the oven for hours, um, you will lose certainly, I don't know how much, but a significant amount of the, of the essential oils out with, okay? Uh, someone's asking, 10 carbons would be a monoterpenoid, correct? Normally, yes, but in the case of anethol, if you count, there's 10 carbons here, even though technically speaking, only nine are on the, uh, the primary structure, and this last little carbon got added on after. So anethol is a, is a phenylpropene, not a monoterpenoid, but it does have a little extra carbon on But those are, in general, normally nine carbons. Building block is to make the phenylpropenes, and 10 carbon building block is for the monoterpenoids. 
but you can have, you can always add or remove things later on just to confuse you, okay? Um, so those are the phenylpropenes. Now the next group we're gonna talk about are the hydroxycinamic acids. And those ones will have a carboxylic acid group again. When you start adding oxygens and carboxylic acid to these structures, it will make it more water soluble. It also uh, raises the boiling point or may not make it easy to boil at all. So um, it's probably not considered an essential oil if you started adding like carboxylic acid to it. I don't think I have to, you could challenge me on that, but uh, I'm pretty sure that will no longer make it found in the uh, in the essential oils, okay? So the next group, as I mentioned, are the hydroxycinamic acids. So those are like the phenylpropenes that we talked about, but they've got this CO2, this acid, this carboxylic acid group uh, at the end, okay? And so two common ones are things like caffeic acid, which has nothing to do with caffeine, but they it is found in coffee and pretty much every other plant on the, on the, uh, on the planet. Uh, and then hydroxycinamic acid or cumeric acid. And this is based on how many of these little OH groups you have on uh, this uh, ring structure. So if you look at caffeic acid, going back to when we're talking about the simple phenols, this is considered a um, um, catechol uh, group here. So this starts looking very similar to things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, all those no nitrogen in it, where you will get that in your amino acids, in your um, amino acids and also your neurotransmitters. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if caffeic acid could potentially modulate those um, those receptors in the body. Um, and maybe some of the effects that polyphenols and and things like simple phenols like caffeic acid have is the fact that they can modulate some of these uh, receptors. Um, so in general, what would I expect you to know from a um, action standpoint? Well, if I say, you know, caffeic acid is known to have which of the following actions associated with it. If you went caffeic acid and you go, oh yeah, it's one of the phenolic acids. And pretty much all, you can just guess that almost all the phenolic acids are going to be antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. We also know that caffeic acid and some of these other compounds have some anti-diabetic actions. And so they may be modulating certain receptors involved with blood sugar regulation. Okay. And I would say probably uh, these are two of the most abundant antioxidants in plants. Uh, I would say, because they're the building block for some of the other things like flavonoids and polyphenols, uh, other polyphenols as well, okay? Uh, so these are very, very abundant. They may not be as powerful as some of the other polyphenols as being, uh, I guess, comparing it like head-to-head -head caffeic acid compared to, let's say, curcumin. It may not be as powerful as curcumin is, but because there's so much more of these in fruits and vegetables that this probably is a more important dietary antioxidant than uh, curcumin because curcumin is only really found in like one genus maybe even just in turmeric i don't know if it's only in turmeric but um pretty much only in one type of herb okay so there's some other ones ferulic acid cumeric acid uh and these guys will come up again and be mentioned in a second so the the thing to remember here is you've got your phenylalanine, which is an amino acid with a nitrogen. That's what makes it an amino acid, this amine group. It gets converted to tyrosine, so you stick an OH group on here. And then it gets, basically that little nitrogen gets removed there, the amine group gets removed. And now we're getting these hydro hydroxycinamic acids. So the phenol compounds we're talking about will not have any nitrogens in it. Once there's a nitrogen attached, it's going to be uh, classified primarily as being an amino acid or as an alkaloid, okay? So the phenylalanine, if it goes this way, you got cinnamic acid, and then you get cinnamaldehyde. This is one of the important constituents in cinnamon oil, okay? It's not really a 
phenolic compound because there's no OH group on there though. Um, or you go down this route and you start getting these uh, plumeric, caffeic, and ferulic acid compounds. Okay, and these are important. Hydroxy cyanic acids are, are, are important. Okay, a lot of the time people don't talk about these that much in nutrition. Uh, they like to talk about more about the bioflavonoids, uh, the anthocyanidins, uh, poly, other polyphenols, but these are really important. Okay. Now, in coffee, coffee has a compound that's kind of unique. Well, I'm sure it's in other compounds, but um, one of the potent antioxidants in coffee is something called chlorogenic acid. Okay. And so, coffee has caffeine. There's going to be flavonoids in it. There's going to be caffeic acid. And then there's this chlorogenic acid. And this is a lot of the antioxidant properties associated with coffee are probably attributed to these compounds here. Okay. And there are a few different forms of it depending on where that quinic acid is added to it. So what you basically have is you've got uh, caffeic acid with this quinic acid, which is kind of a weird little... It's not a, it's not a, if you look at the structure, there's no aromatic ring here. So it kind of started off looking a little bit like um, uh, a gallic acid. And then this OH group was stuck here with, which disrupted the ring structure. So it no longer has that aromatic ring. But this still remains an important water soluble compound. Water soluble, because I look at it and I see all these OH groups, that means you're going to be able to extract it with water. Okay. When you look at, uh, just as an aside, if we jump back to things like cinnamaldehyde, uh, cinnamic acid, these guys are certainly less water soluble because there aren't as many uh, oxygens on these compounds. And what makes things water soluble is lots of oxygens relative to the carbons. So as you increase the number of oxygen to carbon ratio, um, it's, le it's going to be more polar, more water soluble, uh, and less fat soluble. Okay. So if you've ever had any doubts of whether you should be drinking coffee or not, my advice is drink coffee and you can drink lots of coffee. Now, obviously if the caffeine makes you anxious or increases your heart rate, then consume it with food, um, or, uh, drink decaf. So, I like drinking coffee, and so often I'll take coffee, my normal coffee, and I'll cut it with decaf so I can have more of it. And the research shows that people who are high coffee consumers, people who drink basically five or more cups a day, it dramatically reduces the risk of all cause mortality. So basically, it makes you die less, which is great. Okay, we know that it helps prevent diabetes, which is interesting. It reduces the risk of heart attacks. It helps prevent gout. Uh, helps prevent a number of different types of liver diseases, both fatty liver and liver cancer and cirrhosis of the liver. It may reduce Alzheimer's. And then it helps protect you against a whole bunch of different types of cancers, including uh, like cancer of the digestive tract, but also some interesting ones like skin cancer, which I'm not sure how it gets into the skin, but it has a positive effect on skin cancer uh, and some reproductive cancers like prostate and uh, endometrial cancers. So. Coffee is very good for you. Again, the caffeine may leave your adrenal glands feeling a little depleted, so you got to watch that. If you drink it too close to bed, you're not going to be able to fall asleep. And that's not good. So there can be a, you know, a vicious cycle you can get into. Is you're tired, so you drink coffee all day, and then you can't sleep. Uh, and then when you wake up in the morning, you're tired, so you drink lots of coffee, and then you can't sleep. And it may just be that you're drinking coffee too late in the day. Some people, I can drink coffee at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm fine. But if I have it after dinner... Uh, not always, but sometimes it makes it harder to fall asleep. And I know other people, who, my wife just can't have it after 11 o'clock in the morning, otherwise she won't sleep. You, everybody's bodies are different, and also you develop a tolerance to caffeine. If you stop drinking coffee and you're used to drinking all the time, you're going to probably get a pounding headache from it. Um, and so that's one side effect. Some people with digestive issues, it can aggravate. That's another problem. But in general, uh, when you look at a Western diet, it's one of the most important sources of antioxidants, especially if you were thinking about people who are eating just sandwiches and fast food and uh, and uh, a lot of processed foods. Um, coffee would be one of 
the best sources in that particular diet for these antioxidants. Now, if you're eating a plant-based diet, hopefully you're getting lots and lots of other um, phytochemicals that have antioxidant effects, so you wouldn't be entirely relying on the coffee to have that benefit. So, uh, regardless, if you like drinking coffee, keep drinking it. Uh, and uh, if anyone says it's not good for you, you can go and look at the research and show them they're wrong, okay? Uh, so someone's asking me a couple questions. So are phenylpropenes uh, nine carbons or 10 carbons? The basic building block is they start off as nine, but they can be converted to 10 or 11 or 12 later on, okay? But they start off of the phenylpropenes will have six, six carbons on the ring, nine on the side chain, okay? Is chlorogenic acid a subcategory of phenylpropanoids? Um, it's kind of a hybrid molecule because what you what they've done is you've got it's like a hybrid, it's a subcategory. I haven't really mentioned it, uh, but yes, it would be kind of a subcategory of phenylpropanoids. But what the plant, what the coffee plant has done is it's taken this uh, quinic acid and then stuck it on to chlorogenic acid. So it's 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 kind of a, a hybrid, like a centaur. Half caffeic acid, half quinic acid, okay? And you'll see that again when we're talking about uh, flavonolignans. They're kind of the same way. Half a flavonoid compound, half a phenylpropanoid compound, okay? Uh, someone's asking, about what about the acrolamide in coffee? So acrylamide is a cancer-causing substance in, in coffee. And so the concern is that during the roasting, you produce this carcinogenic compound. And so some state in the U.S. was putting a warning on coffee saying that it causes cancer uh, because it contains that compound. Um, and so, yes, there are cancer-causing substances in coffee, but that doesn't mean that drinking coffee increases the risk for coffee. And that's why you have to look at population studies rather than looking at purely the, the phytochemicals in it. So when you look at, um, for example, for example, tobacco, I'm sure cigarettes have antioxidants in it and they probably have some anti-cancer compounds in it, but that doesn't mean if you smoke, you'll prevent cancer, you know? So it's kind of the flips, flip side of that. And also there are um, other, plants out there that, uh, for example, cinnamon has, uh, certain types of cinnamon have compounds that are great antioxidants, but then there can also be some other compounds on there that can cause liver problems. So you really have to look at um, what happens when people are, like dietary uh, studies, when they're looking at uh, epidemiological studies in larger groups, because your diet is so complex that there could be even look at like, uh, you can do studies with on diet to that shows um, you know, eating meat is good for you. Uh, there's, I remember the dairy industry was trying to push the how uh, that there are anti-cancer compounds in, in milk. One of them is called CLA, conjugate linoleic acid. And that has some anti-cancer effects. So there, there was some people saying that dairy helps prevent cancer, but all human studies show that it increases the risk of cancer consuming cheese and, and drinking milk. Uh, you don't hear a lot about that, but the research is definitely out there for prostate and breast cancer. Uh, and so just because it has one compound that may prevent cancer doesn't mean consuming the whole foods version of it, you're going to get that same benefit. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. There's lots of research showing coffee has anti-cancer effects. And so I suspect that the the positive things in coffee outweigh the negative things from the acrolamide. Uh, Laura is saying, doesn't caffeine raise cortisol? Yep, I'm sure it must because it sort of can jack up your cortisol, but that's not always a bad thing. Like I said, if you're caffeine, the caffeine can have negative effects in coffee, but it doesn't mean if you have a certain number of cups a day, 
that it's going to have that negative effect. And if you're susceptible to coffee and the caffeine uh, and it makes you jittery, then don't drink it. There are lots of other antioxidants you can consume. But if you don't have any issues with the caffeine in it or you want to drink decaf, then I don't think that would apply. Okay. Uh, what about the cardiovascular effects consuming that much caffeine? Uh, one of the things is that people, have been, again, if you look at the risks, it appears to reduce the risk of having a heart attack. It doesn't have a major effect on blood pressure. Where the problem comes in is if you're not a coffee drinker and you drink a whole bunch acutely, you're probably going to get elevated blood pressure, anxiety, and everything else. Uh, how about people who are slow metabolizers of caffeine and coffee increases the risk for heart disease? I've never seen that. If you if there's any evidence on that, that would be good because a lot of the studies that I'm looking are when they're just looking at a population of lots and lots of people. And there's always going to be some people within that population that may have a different metabolism. And maybe that 90% of people or 95% of people, coffee is good for the heart. But if you are, if you have some heart condition of some sort, maybe it's not good. But again, I think more of the issue is if you're used to drinking four cups a day, like I can drink seven cups of coffee a day and it has no impact on me. Uh, while someone who doesn't drink seven cups of coffee a day uh, may find that they get heart palpitations and everything else. So it's, again, if you're changing, whatever you're accustomed to is probably good. If you're drinking one cup a day and you go off to five or six, you may not feel good. But again, I didn't include anxiety uh, or anything else. I'm just talking about the research supporting how it helps prevent heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's. The research is there. There are side effects to it. But there's a lot of benefits to it, okay? Yeah, that's for, I remember seeing it. In California, uh, they put a warning on coffee saying that because of the alcohol in the amides, it causes cancer. If you want me to dig up all the, I'll send you guys, anyone who wants the studies that they've done on coffee, I can just send copy and paste it and send it out there if you want to know. Uh, and if any new evidence comes out showing that, uh, the studies that I've looked at are wrong, I'm, I'll change, no problem. Um, but it seems to be, coffee is one of those controversial things, so I'm trying to, uh, I'll admit my bias because I like drinking coffee. Uh, but there is a lot of good in coffee, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I don't think there's any good in smoking uh, cigarettes, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, if you're smoking, um, I think there was a couple of studies done by Imperial Tobacco showing that it helps with Alzheimer's disease, but, uh, I would kind of question those that research. Uh, let me check my time because we started off some. So let's take a 10 minute break now and we'll come back at 11 o'clock. If you guys have any questions, let me know, okay? Uh, and I guess I answered your question. We will have a break right now, okay? So come back in 10 minutes.
You guys, <clears throat> okay, you guys hear me okay? For some reason my go-to webinar is not loading up the video very quickly here. You guys can you hear me? Is the sound okay or is it, uh, is there any issues? I don't know where my videos. I'm, oh, I have such troubles today. Okay. Uh, anyways, I was going through. I might my video might just kick in eventually, um, but I don't think you can. See, you you guys can't see me right now. Is that correct? So I was going through a bunch of studies to see whether or not uh, there's any new evidence showing coffee that something causes cancer. And most of this, when you look at the mortality, there's a whole bunch of studies. And most of them that I found were all positive. I found a negative one on instant coffee, which is fine because I don't drink instant coffee. Um, and when you're looking up for heart disease, like I said, all those studies, there's even more like in the last couple of years. Uh, it just, here's one to five cups a day associated with lower risk of death. And all the studies seem to have this positive thing. 15% uh, risk reduction, which is you know, not huge, but it's still significant. It's, and some of the other studies I was looking at where they found there was an increased risk of cancer, like with bladder cancer, it may be associated with, for example, um, a lot of people who drink coffee in some of these places were also smokers, right? And we know smoking increased the risk of bladder cancer. So, uh, what's going on with this? You guys can see me? Oh. Okay, well, I don't know why my, I've got a little, you can't see it, but I got my little, uh, my screen's having a little uh, rolling thing. I can't seem to turn on or off my, my video now, but anyways. Okay, so if you guys find anything negative, that's really, uh, if you guys can find any negative studies on coffee, let me know. I, I couldn't find any for heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And uh, it looks like, from the research standpoint, for big, big, big trials, they all seem to show benefit. Okay, and I'm willing to admit I'm wrong, or that I'm only as good as the research I look at. Right. So if there's research, I try to be fair and look at all the research, but you know I can't look at every single study. So if you find something, let me know. Uh, okay, moving on, polyphenols. So these are phenolic compounds. Poly means many, phenols meaning phenolic compounds. So there's some unique polyphenols out there that we're gonna discuss. One of the first ones, I like rosemary. I think rosemary's got a lot of really interesting phytochemicals in it. There are some uh, important triterpenoid compounds in it that have anti-cancer effects. Uh, it also has something called rosemarinic acid, which I think is an important compound. It appears to have some uh, benefits against allergies. Uh, it's going to have it because it's a polyphenol. You've got these two OH groups. So what it basically is is you've got two cathetic acid molecules stuck together, more or less. Okay, um, and so I don't know if it's that much superior to cathetic acid on its own. If it has some unique properties to it. 
but it's found in lots of different uh, plants, including those in the mint family. So rosemary, I guess, is one of the ones that it contains higher amounts or one of the first places they've discovered it. But most of the time when you're eating uh, any kind of spices or having herbal teas, you're going to have some of this in your in your diet. It appears to have antioxidant, also some anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, I think it's got some anti-cancer effects as well. And uh, rosemarinic acid is high in another herb. I think it's called prunella, which is used in Asian medicine for colds. Um, and I often will recommend rosemary tea with another herb called stinging nettle. Um, and so else I put in the tea. Remember. Um, and it appears to have some benefits for oh, eyebright. Uh, so eyebright, rosemary, and uh, nettle tea. Uh, I often recommend to patients for seasonal allergies. And I think it has an antihistamine effect. And, um, it doesn't have any major side effects, and hopefully a lot of side benefits to it as well. Okay. So rosemary acid for the exam. I might just say rosemarinic acid, which is found in rosemary, uh, is a classified as a polyphenol A, terpenoid B. I might ask that. Uh, I might, I might say uh, rosemarinic acid, which uh, is found in rosemary, has been shown to have which of the following acids? actions: A, antioxidant, comma, anti-inflammatory, comma, anti-allergic. Like usually, we'll throw a couple. Um, uh, actions in one. So if you don't remember the one, you'll get the other ones. Okay. Now, another really interesting group of polyphenols are the curcuminoids. Now, on the right hand side, you can see a photograph of turmeric. So if you go to um, uh, a lot of the outdoor markets in Little India, <clears throat> you'll see ginger and you'll also see turmeric. And so turmeric is a cousin of ginger. They, all, they look very similar on the outside. They look like small uh, uh, ginger roots. Technically speaking, it's a rhizome, not a root. But um, And if you break it in half, it has this nice yellowy orange color. kind of looks like almost like a carrot. And that nice bright orangey yellow color is uh, associated with the curcuminoids. Now, curcumin is the main yellow color in turmeric. But there are other curcuminoids as well. And, and appreciate when the plant's making curcumin, they'll be, they, maybe this represents 90% of their curcuminoids. And then there's a few other ones that are kind of maybe a little OH group gets stuck on this, or a uh, methyl group gets stuck on this OH group. Or also appreciate that when you consume something like tumor and you've got the curcumins there. They will be metabolized by your gut bacteria to perform or to basically release other uh, different types of compounds. So when this gets metabolized, you're probably going to have some of these bacteria are going to cleave off some of these uh, phenol groups. And, and then there could be other things that get absorbed in addition to just curcumin. Because one of the challenges with curcumin as a supplement is it's not that easy for your body to absorb it. So there's a lot of strategies that certain supplement supplement companies that they'll try to figure out ways to get better absorption. So some studies are uh, show that if you combine it with black pepper, it increases the absorption. The initial studies were done on rats, and they found that it increases the absorption like a thousand fold compared to uh, if you do black pepper and turmeric together versus. Uh, and then the main active ingredient in black pepper is the piperine. Um, there's other studies that I saw that show that it works in rats, but doesn't work in humans. Uh, so originally I was doing it with black pepper and telling patients just add a little black pepper to your turmeric and you should get some good absorption. And then I stopped telling people to do that because the human trial didn't show benefit. And now I've looked at another human trial that shows benefit. So I don't know if it works or it doesn't anymore. Um, certainly there's the potential for it to work. And if you're a rat, it'll definitely work. In humans, uh, it might be showing, there might be enough human trials now to show benefit. So some studies will do that. Other studies will uh, try other strategies to get the absorption, to increase the absorption. Um, and so basically what curcumin is, it's, it's two phenylpropanoid derivatives stuck together, kind of lengthways it looks like. 
And so you get this beautiful compound that has all these conjugated double bonds that allows the molecule to reflect light of a certain wavelength. Because the different colors between plants is, depends on these conjugated double bonds, okay? Um, curcumin, if you go into PubMed and type in curcumin, there are, well, let's just do it right now for fun. Let's have a web browser open. So if I type in curcumin, there are almost 14,000 studies done on curcumin, okay? Some of these are going to be uh, human studies. Some of them are going to be animal studies. Some of these are going to be in vivo studies. But 14,000 studies is an awful lot. Uh, compare that to, like, quercetin, which is an important, probably one of the most, uh, quercetin is up there. It's like 18,000. So there's a lot of uh, research done on these two polyphenols. Uh, resveratrol. We're going to talk about that in a second. Curious, but it's very strong. How we, how's it doing? So around twelve thousand. So there's for all these, for those three um, polyphenols, some good research. Rosmarinic acid, rosmarinic acid. I typed that wrong. I don't have my glasses. So I can't see very well. Uh, only about, only about sixteen hundred. Not as many as the other ones, but still. So. Definitely, there's a lot of research conducted on curcumin. And when you look at um, countries that consume a lot of curcumin, for example, in India, India, even though, I think I mentioned uh, the first lecture, even though it's one of the most polluted places on the planet, it has some of the lowest cancer rates. And presumably, I think there's a few reasons for that. One, for the most part, they're eating a plant-rich diet, even though they're eating more processed foods and stuff but for the most they, they eat a lot of uh vegetarian foods uh so their meat consumption is probably lower than in the western world uh i think that plays a role as well in reducing the risk for cancer uh but one of the other big things is they just they add spices to everything so um most of their food curries will have some turmeric in it and also ginger, and they're going to have it's going to be cinnamon and clove, and all these other things that have probably some beneficial effects. They have lots of plants in their foods, lots of vegetarian dishes, and so I think that I don't think that the reason why India has low cancer rates is, can only be attributed to curcumin. I think there's a few other things involved as well, but consuming it on a daily basis, I would say it's safe because when you look at how many people in India consume it on a daily basis it seems to be working over there. Um, the actions associated with it is antioxidant because you know it's a polyphenol. You know polyphenols are phenolic compounds and pretty much every single phenolic compound will have that antioxidant effect. It seems to be more potent anti-inflammatory than some of the other uh, phenolic acids that we talked about. So even though it looks like probably a couple ferulic acid molecules or caffeic acid molecules stuck together and modified, it doesn't, uh, curcumin has more potent antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer properties compared to the other ones. So the other ones are more abundant, but this one seems to be even more specific and potent. Uh, so it's great for cancer as well. It appears to have a bunch of studies show it helps protect your liver from some toxic assault, uh, may increase bile flow. Now, just as an aside, one of the things I'd like to say is that, again, when you're trying to understand the benefits of a plant or, let's say, you're trying to figure out why India is so low in cancer, it's, it's most researchers want to try to figure out what that magic thing is. And they use kind of that reductionistic model. They go, okay, what is everyone eating? They're eating curry. What's in curry? Tumor. So it must be the tumor. What's in the tumor? It's the curcumin. So then, are, so then you may end up trying to conclude that the benefit of uh, the health benefits uh, in India are associated with curcumin because that's what you've reduced it down to. And I, and I think it's really foolish to think that way. Um, and I would say that curcumin is important, but even within the tumor plant, even though curcumin is the most widely researched component in there as an anti-inflammatory, there are other curcuminoids that have health benefits in there. There are essential oils in the tumor group that have health benefits, probably. There is 
a couple studies that suggest that in addition to curcumin, they've taken turmeric extracts and removed all the curcumin from it. And so it's left with a number of carbohydrates and some other things, but the curcuminoids have been removed. And they found that the carbohydrate fractions also have an immunomodulating anti-inflammatory effect to it. So a lot of the supplement companies might argue that you can't take turmeric powder as and have it be a very effective antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, everything else. But I've never seen anyone do a head-to-head -head comparison of taking one teaspoon of turmeric and adding it to your shake compared to taking four turmeric capsules that are super highly absorbed. Like, I don't know. No one's ever done the research. And so, obviously, the supplement companies want to encourage you to buy their products and I think they are trying to sincerely make good products that are superior than taking just turmeric powder because you could literally go and I told patients go buy a, for two bucks you can buy a huge bag of turmeric powder and take that or you could buy a $60 bottle of highly absorbable turmeric but you know I don't know which one's going to work better nobody does I don't think or if they do they're not telling us so um so I use both the whole herb and sometimes I'll recommend in particular if someone has cancer or something where we're really trying to get that curcumin in higher amounts and I'll use the uh, curcumin supplements, but they are expensive. Okay. Uh, so there you go. So curcumin is awesome, but again, it's not the only awesome thing in uh the diet of India. And even within turmeric, there's going to be other very important phytochemicals. Okay. And I remember going back, if you guys remember the carrot study where they basically looked at all the benefits, uh, why smokers eating that carotenoid rich diet are getting less lung cancer. They just thought it might just be due to the beta carotene. So they started supplementing everyone with beta carotene and they found that people started getting more cancer. So in that situation, um, the beta carotene was a biomarker for uh, a diet rich in plants, you know, fruits and vegetables and other plant material. And so I'm not saying that turmeric or curcumin falls under that sort of category, but I'm saying it could, you know. So let's talk about some other polyphenols. There are flavonoids and stilbenoids. These are neat compounds, okay? And they're all neat compounds. So starting off with that building block, the hydroxycinamic acid, or also called cumeric acid, what happens is the plant goes and adds a bunch of other little groups on there. These those are acetyl groups it adds on until you have this long chain that then can form like a cyclization reaction. So from this cumeric acid, you end up getting a bunch of things added on to make flavonoids, and it becomes a three-membered ring structure. It's called a polyphenol because you've got the phenolic group here and another phenolic group there. The one in the middle is not a... Uh, Ethanol group. Um, it's a ring structure, but it's in, its, in this case, it has to be an aromatic ring, but it's not actually uh, a phenol group because there's that OH, that O group in the middle acting as a, as a bridge between that section there. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got stilbenoids. And so quercetin are, is probably the most well known um, polyphenol, uh, maybe. I'd say it's one of the most well-known polyphenols, uh, and that's in the flavonoid class, while resveratrol is probably the best-known stilbenoid. Okay, so we're going to talk about these two groups separately. We'll start with the stilbenoids. So what a stilbenoid is, it's a polyphenol, okay? You've got these two aromatic ring structures with the OH attached to it. It has a short bridge of only two carbons separating them, and... When you drink red wine, the benefits of red wine are associated to the red color, which are the anthocyanidins, and also to the resveratrol, okay? And we'll talk about the anthocyanidins later on. They're a type of um, polyphenol as well. But resveratrol is a very, really interesting compound. Again, because it's a polyphenol, you can deduce it's going to have antioxidant effects, probably going to have some anti-inflammatory effects. Um, this compound is being researched as an anti-aging compound. And what's interesting, when you look at the research on aging, we have a little, we have a timer. Every human has a timer set to go off at a certain time and we start to age. And we are programmed to die 
usually around 80 or so, assuming we don't die of prematurely because of heart disease, cancer, or diabetes, or something else. So if everyone eats the same healthy diet and you don't die prematurely, you're going to die you know, normally around 80 plus, 80 to 85, maybe 78 to 85, depending on the number of factors. Um, consuming antioxidants and other polyphenols can help prevent premature dying, but we've never been able to extend maximum lifespan by just taking antioxidants. And one of the beliefs before was that because we breathe oxygen, it causes our bodies to rust. So therefore taking antioxidants can help prevent that and we can live much longer, but it doesn't seem to be the case. It's they're good for you, but they, it won't make you live to 140 if you just ate tons and tons of these antioxidants. A couple of things have been shown to extend maximum maximum lifespan. One of these have been caloric restricted diet. So if you semi-starve yourself, it seems to affect certain genes and make people live longer, uh, or at least they suspect it will uh, make people live longer. That's been established certainly in animal studies. They've been doing this research for well over I don't know, it's fifty years now, or however, however many years for decades, anyways. Um, so eating more is bad for you, uh, and eating a lot less and almost starving yourself actually does seem to extend maximum lifespan. It might be related to um, a number of things, but uh, um, it might also be related to meat consumption because we know that a methine, methionine deficient diet, methionine is high in animal meats, dairy, eggs, and, and meat in general, and it's pretty deficient in a vegetarian or, or no, not vegetarian, vegan diet. And if you look at some of the research on methionine rich or deficient diets, it seems to extend life that way. So I don't know if it's related to caloric in intake or if it's related to a specific uh, amino acid or what it is, but uh, caloric restriction diets and reducing methionine in your diet definitely helps to make people live longer. Um, and another thing that may be beneficial is resveratrol. Um, this is still being researched and it seems to it appears to interact with a number of genes involved with aging. Uh, a lot of the researchers say that the dose you would need to get is far higher than anything you can get from drinking wine. So you'll end up, if you try to get it from wine, you're just going to end up getting uh, liver failure and, and other types of cancers that cause you to die sooner than, uh, and you won't be able to achieve the, the optimal amount of the resveratrol. So I don't think there's any really good human trials conducted. There's potential for this to promote longevity. They're probably doing the animal studies now. I haven't looked at it recently, but uh, there's some neat properties with resveratrol that goes beyond just being a polyphenol uh, in general, okay? Um, the other thing with resveratrol is um, it's a phytoestrogen. And so like a lot of things uh, in plants, it has the potential to modulate estrogen receptors. So um, some of its good and bad properties could be associated with that. I don't know how it is for breast cancer risks and things like that, but appreciate that it does have that bill, the ability to interact with estrogen receptors to exert some influence there. Okay. Um, there is a rhubarb extract that contains a stilbenoid that's very similar to res resveratrol in, in structure. Uh, that one of the supplement companies uh, has marketed and there's research support. I won't bother mentioning the name of it. And uh, the one supplement company is basically guaranteeing that it could reduce your risk of, you know, uh, hot flashes and other symptoms associated with menopause. Uh, and they guaranteed like money back guarantee. The product was researched primarily in Europe, but the main active ingredient is a compound that looks remarkably like resveratrol, but comes from a different source. Um, there's another product, uh, herb in Chinese medicine called Fo Tea, and one of the active ingredients in it is a stilbenoid that looks a bit like resveratrol. And Fo Tea is used as a kidney tonic uh, designed to promote longevity. And so maybe there's something to this, you know. Uh, in addition to those herbs we mentioned, uh, grapes, blueberries, peanuts all have this to some degree. Not a lot, but they do have some of it in there. Uh, I'm not taking a, a resveratrol supplement. Uh, I'm always a bit cautious. Uh, I'm concerned that it may not have the desired effects in humans, like we've done with other antioxidants, taking high amounts of one 
that sometimes led to problems. Uh, so there, this could be a magic supplement for promoting longevity, or maybe they'll find that it ends up increases the risk of some other condition later on when you take super high amounts. So for now, I'm only drinking wine to eat a little bit of resveratrol in my body uh, and uh, avoiding the supplements. But there may be some benefits in supplementing with it as well. Now, when it comes to the flavonoids, flavonoids are polyphenols, and they have a number of different classes associated with it. Now, you may have heard of flavones, flavanols, uh, anthocyanidins. The different names of these are uh, it's categorized based on its structure and uh, whether it has the presence of uh, a ketone group or a hydroxyl group or where this third ring structure is located. And we'll go through and explain a few examples. In general, all these flavonoids that are polyphenols will all have antioxidant effects. Some of them may have some unique properties. There are certain receptors that they, they may, one might be able to interact with compared to another one. So, uh, in general, flavones, when you see it, own, that O-N-E, is related to ketones. So, chemical structures often that have that own refers to a ketone structure. And what a ketone structure is, uh, a double bond to an O. So I've highlighted a ketone there. So a flavone is a, has the ketone structure there. And that's kind of the most defining part of it. Isoflavone also has a ketone structure, but what's happened is that iso refers to the positioning of the third ring structure. So normally it's at the second position on this second ring. And in this case, it becomes, uh, it's located at the third structure, okay, at this third point here. Uh, so the way you number this second ring structure is one is where the oxygen is, two, three. So instead of being at the two, it's at the three. Flavonols, so it's a flavone, but it also has OL, is added to the end, and because there is an OH group. So ketones are ONEs. Uh, the hydroxyl groups or the alcohol, the OH groups, usually end in OL. So flavonols means you've got a ketone on the center ring as well as uh, this OL group, this uh, hydroxy group. Okay. Then you've got the flava. So here you got an A instead of an O. That would mean that basically refers to the absence of a ketone. And then you've got the OL, which refers to the hydroxy group. So it's um, not a flavone, technically speaking. So it's not a bio, a bio fla flavone. Uh, it's a flavanol. And then you, the final group is you have an anthocyanidin. And this, um, you don't actually have, uh, you have an alcohol group here, and you also don't have that ketone group there. Okay. So the flavonoids usually refers to the ketones, but flavanols are technically a flavone, but they're related to it. Okay. Now, I grabbed this slide because it's too hard to type them all up. Here's a list of important flavonoid classes. Um, anthocyanins, flavin 3 alls flav flavonones, flavones, flavonols, a whole bunch of different ones, and you can go through the list. So basically, important sources are going to be berries, fruits and vegetables, chocolate, tea, uh, apples, lots of different things. Walnuts have some stuff in there too. And so when you look at, uh, here's an example of flavonoid intake and all-cause mortality. And so RRR refers to relative risk reduction. And so what they're basically saying for this is that uh, they took a bunch of women who were over 75 years old and they find the risk of these women dying in the next five years was around 12% risk for these particular women in this, in this study group. And what they found is that women that consume high amounts of flavonoids, and I don't know what they define as being high amounts, uh, but they had some little way of extrapolating that from their diet diaries and stuff. 
that basically consuming lots of flavonoid-rich foods reduced your risk of dying by about 63%. And that's pretty significant. And so 63% uh, is the relative risk reduction. The absolute risk reduction is lowering it by 7.6%. And so what that means is basically for every 23 women who consumed a diet that was high in flavonoids, you were able to lower the risk by about, uh, or uh, you could save one person's life, uh, which is pretty cool, okay? Here's another one that showed only green tea. So not all the, not like, so people were drinking a lot of green tea. So they were specifically looking at only that. So you'd have to be drinking about five cups a day of green tea. And what they found with this is you lower the risk of people dying by about 15%, okay, uh, in that particular one. So about one in 59 people would benefit from drinking all that tea. So those are examples of uh, specific flavonoids called catechins and green tea and some of the other things in there. Uh, and the other one's just a high flavonoid-rich diet. So flavones, moving on, if you remember here, we've got the ketone group here. There's no OH group here. It's at the two ring position and the ketones at the four position, okay? So what I might ask for on the exam is uh, flavones have A, an alcohol at the three position, B, the second ring structure of the four position, C, a ketone at the four position, or D, no alcohol, no ketone. I might ask that on the, on the exams. That's about to the extent of the of the uh, chemistry I might ask for. And all you have to remember is that flavones have ketones. That's what I'm really looking for. So I might try to make this question sound really picky. I wouldn't bother saying, has a ketone at the position 1, A, position 2, B, position C, D, etc. Or 3, C, you know what I'm saying. So... Two important flavones in our diet is apigenin, which is found, uh, is rich in celery. It's also found in chamomile tea and parsley. Um, I think apigenin is a really important flavonoid in our diet. I have never seen the supplement for it. But if you're drinking uh, chamomile tea and you're eating celery, you're going to be getting a whole bunch of that. Um, so because it's a polyphenol, you know there's going to be antioxidant effects, there's going to be anti-inflammatory effects. Apigenin is a little bit unique compared to some of the other polyphenols. Um, although I'm sure some of them have it. I know that apigenin does have, and luteolin as well, does have some antispasmodic effects. And so it help, helps to relax smooth muscles in the intestinal tract. And so both celery and chamomile contains essential oils. But in addition to the essential oils, it contains some flavonoids that also have some antispasmodic effects where they can relax these smooth muscles. And that's one of the reasons why probably uh, chamomile tea is useful for menstrual cramps. Uh, it can also be used for uh, digestive colic. So um, again, with the chamomile, I don't think it's just one active ingredient. I think there's multiple things working in there. Uh, we know it has anti-cancer effects. Apigenin has been shown to have uh, to induce apoptosis in prostate cancer lines, and I've seen for other cancer lines. It seems to be a really important compound. Also, it appears to have an anxiolytic effect. Apigenin may modulate some of the benzodiazepine receptors in the body that are involved with uh, sedation and calming people down. So when you drink a cup of chamomile tea and it has a calming effect, it's likely associated with apigenin. Uh, we also know that eating a plant-rich diet seems to have a bit of a calming effect for people. Uh, and it may be that there are certain flavonoids that have this calming effect that are just abundant in a plant-based diet. Uh, also, these compounds have some anti-diabetic effects, seem to lower cholesterol as well. So lots of really cool things. So again, these are non-essential nutrients. You technically don't need them in your diet, but you will... Uh, if you're preventing heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, those are some of the top causes of death. So um, good to eat lots of this stuff. Also, celery lowers blood pressure. I don't know whether it's the flavonoids themselves that are lowering the um, blood pressure or whether it's other compounds in there, but 
that's something important. Uh, another important compound, uh, which is found more in citrus, is nerogen and, and uh, reparis, reparogen. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go on part of this slide and I'll go back to those in a second. So here is a diagram I saw, and you don't need to know this, but here is a diagram about the anti cancer effects of luteolin. And you can see there's several diff different mechanisms where it can work. It can uh, target this protein here, it can reduce oxidative stress over here. Uh, it affects some of these enzymes like PKC, which is involved with cancer initiation. Uh, so this has got four different mechanisms. And here's, I don't even know what JNK uh, protein does because since I've taken, I got my biochem degree about 25 years ago or so. so uh, 20 years ago, so there's a lot of changes since then. But to me, it looks like the take home here is that luteolin, which is a flavone, has anti cancer effects through multiple mechanisms beyond just removing free radicals in the body. Okay. Oh, there's another one, five, induces apoptosis too. Uh, so here we've got orange and grapefruit. They both contain an important flavone. One has hesperidin, the other one has nerogenin. I think there is a typo over here. I am, that's how I think it's spelled. Hold on one second. Spiritin. Hess. Yeah, that's not right. Hess. Didn't look right. Hesperitin. There we go. Um. So orange and grapefruit, they're loaded with antioxidants. And a little bit of orange juice is, every day is probably a good thing for you. Um, consuming like a liter of orange juice is probably a bad thing because there's way too much sugar. So oranges and grapefruits, they have lots of important phytochemicals in there. They've got vitamin C. They've got a, a number of other things. But you got to watch the sugar consumption. Uh, so... One orange might be good for you, but 10 oranges a day might be bad for you. So if you overdo it, I've seen this with weight loss patients where uh, they've lost all this weight and all of a sudden they put on six pounds in two weeks or eight pounds in two weeks. When I take the history, I'm like, you know, what are you doing wrong here? Are you eating candy, chips, fries? No, no, no. But it just happened to be that they're eating, started eating a whole bunch of oranges because they had a sweet tooth and they're, instead of eating candy, they're eating fruit. And that can be... For a diabetic, just as bad for you as eating candy. Or maybe not just as bad. Maybe it's better, but it's still not perfect. You gotta watch your blood sugar, okay? Uh, so again, just because one orange reduces the risk of high phytochemicals that can lower the risk for cancer and have beneficial effects on heart disease, doesn't mean that eating 100 oranges a day is still gonna give you that benefit. And in fact, often it could cause the opposite, just like wine. One glass of wine might help prevent heart disease. Ten glasses of wine will increase the risk of heart disease. And that's called that J-curve I mentioned in the first lecture. Okay? So everything in moderation. Uh, now, this flavonoid, Baclin, is from Chinese skullcap. Chinese skullcap uh, is different than uh, a herb we have in, in uh, Western herbalism that, that we just call skullcap. Chinese skullcaps found in a lot of traditional Chinese formulas for uh, infection and inflammation and cancer. Uh, and what's really neat about this, uh, and I suspect, and it is also found just as an aside in, in uh, skullcap that's used in uh, Western herbalism. Skullcap in Western herbalism is used more for anxiety and sleep and things like that. And the Chinese ones have more of this anti-inflammatory effects to it. And so we know that this particular flavone, and I think other flavonoids will do this and flavones will do this, it appears to inhibit uh, multidrug resistant pumps. So when we talked about in the first lecture, certainly research shows it does this for a number of different types of drugs out there. So consuming Chinese skullcap along with an antibiotic could help reduce or reverse um, resistance to those antibiotics, which is kind of neat. And there's a bunch of studies there. You don't need to know a lot of that, but just remember that this uh, compound has the potential for uh, inhibiting drug resistance. Now some flavanols. So these are ones that have the ketone at the four position and the alcohol at the three position. Uh, I think for the exam purposes, I think all I really want you to know that it contains both the ketone and 
the hydroxy or the alcohol uh, on the ring structure. So quercetin is sort of the archetypal um, flavanol, okay? And these, all these flavonoids we talked about so far can exist in nature as glycosides. So often you can have sugars attached to this and then it becomes a different compound with a different name. But the A-glycone component is often related to quercetin. And please appreciate it, quercetin is one of the most commonly found uh, flavonols, flavonols, okay? Uh, onions are rich in it. So when you look at the picture of the onion on the left, that nice yellow color that you see in onions is associated with quercetin. But it's also found in tea. Now tea has other bioflavonoids in there that are beneficial, in particular that have, has catechins, um, but quercetin will be in there as well. Leafy vegetables are gonna have it. Citrus will have this as well as some of the other ones we discussed already. Now, flavus in Latin refers to, means yellow. And so uh, a lot of these flavonol, flavonols uh, get their name because they have a nice yellow pigment associated with them, okay? Like any kind of polyphenol, they're antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. I have used quercetin as a supplement alone in some cases for uh, allergies. And so I think there's an antihistamine effect. Works pretty good. I mean, it's not super powerful, but a little vitamin C and quercetin can maybe lower symptoms from 20 to 50% in some patients. Um, so it's an option for them. Uh, I think it also lowers blood pressure as well. Uh, may have some anxiolytic effects, may have some antispasmodic effects. Probably the list of actions pretty long. Um, but I don't use these a lot as supplements, only for allergies and for short periods of time. Again, the glycosides like rutin, which is, this is a glycoside of uh, quercetin. You cleave off the sugar and this gives you that quercetin molecule, okay? So isoflavones, uh, the main difference here is you've got that ketone group at the four position, but now instead of having the ring structure attached at the two position, it's at the three position. So genistein and didazine are the two most common isoflavones in uh, soy. Because they're polyphenols, they're going to have antioxidant effects, they're going to have anti-cancer effects. Um, in addition, they have a phytoestrogenic effect. And we discussed this in the first lecture. So soy is one of the big sources. But things like red clover also contains these two uh, isoflavones. And licorice um, is also known to have some phytoestrogenic properties, along with a whole bunch of other properties with it. And one of the phytoestrogens in it um, has, is an isoflavone, just so you know. Uh, so this is the compound in licorice. It's kind of a, a different looking compound, um, but it, it does have some phytoestrogenic effects. And in Chinese medicine, they use licorice. And a lot of formulas used for female health purposes and fertility. Uh, and I'm sure there's other things in it that have that exert some kind of influence, but this is one of the things I suspect. Okay. Uh, flavanols. So moving down to the bottom. So these two, the flavanols and the anthocyanidins, they're not true flavonoids uh, because they don't have the ketone group, okay? Um, chocolate and tea are two foods that are rich in flavin, flavanols, okay? So there are things called flavin three alls, and so three refers to the position where the OH group is attached to it. And these guys, presumably a lot of, like, tea makes a lot of these compounds, like catechin, uh, because they absorb UV light. And that may help protect the tea plant from uh, getting sunburnt, because usually if you know anything about tea, it grows at high altitudes. And at high altitudes, there's less ozone, so you're more likely to get a sunburn on top of a mountain than you would at sea level. And so the catechin may be one of the ways that it, acts as a natural sunscreen for these plants, okay? Uh, so tea and chocolate both have different types of uh, flavin 3 alls in it. Um, catechin and epicatechin are the two most common sources of these. Um, 
they've been researched for helping prevent heart disease, cancer, all sorts of different things. Um, yeah. I don't know how different catechin is from uh, quercetin. I suspect that there are some properties because sometimes adding a single ketone or shuffling around some OH groups will have a profound effect on the molecule and, and how it can interact with the body. Uh, here's a study that shows tea consumption decreases uh, mortality. Now, in green tea, there's a compound that you may have heard of called EGCG. And this got a lot of research, I remember about 10 years ago. Uh, it's not found in very high amounts in black tea, and it's certainly not found in coffee, okay? So it's in white and green tea, not coffee. It's not in uh, black tea, because the fermentation process to make black tea tends to denature and break this comp these compounds down. Uh, and it's not in chocolate, okay? The main structure of it is you have a compound called epi- Okay, hold on. The epicatechin compound. Oh, uh, the epicatechin has a gallic, uh, a gallic molecule, gallic acid molecule attached to it. So you've got this flavin 3 all up here with gallic acid attached to it. Gallic acid is a tannin, um, pretty stringent little compound. And so this may have some additional benefits over just the flavanol by itself. So it's got antioxidant effects, anti-cancer effects, may help with chronic fatigue. There may be some benefit for people with HIV, endometriosis. And so some of these symptoms I have, some of these indications I haven't seen uh, with the other flavonoids. Maybe they exist, but I haven't seen them, okay? Uh, so what's interesting with the green tea is what's, shown to decrease mortality or death from heart disease in both men and women. And, but they didn't found a big association with reducing cancer risk in that study, which surprised me because I always thought of green tea as being like this big anti-cancer thing, but it may not have the benefits that we thought, okay? Uh, I'm gonna do one last slide and I'll be finished. So polyphenols, last group we're gonna talk about are the anthocyanidins. These are the red, purple, and blue pigments you see in a lot of berries and other things. If you look at this eggplant, it's kind of like a giant blueberry from a phytochemical standpoint. That outer shell is rich in various anthocyanidins. Um, there are two names. There are things called anthocyanins and anthocyanidins. The anthocyanins are basically the, sh the glycoside. So you, when, once you attach sugars onto the anthocyanidins, you have the anthocyanins. And that makes it even more water soluble. So when you're drinking wine and blueberry juice, both the anthocyanidins and anthocyanins are water soluble. But once you stick a sugar on, it's going to make it even more water soluble. Now the main difference with these guys is um, how the double bonds are disrupted here. There's actually a positive charge on the oxygen here, and there seems to be uh, conjugated bonds connecting all the rings there. And by doing that, it changes the light that gets emitted from it so that you get those pigments. So uh, depending on how many conjugated double bonds you have will determine whether or not you're uh, absorbing UV light or whether you're able to uh, reflect yellow or blue or red or whatever the color is, okay? So changing the acidity of this, interestingly enough, can actually change the color that they emit. So um, acidic cranberry juice, is red in color, and if you alkalinize it and it becomes more neutral, it will become more blue and purple in color, which is just kind of interesting. Um, in addition to berries, you find it in things like red cabbage. When you look at some of the new carrots that are on the market that are like purple in color, they'll have more of these anthocyanidins in it as well. Uh, these are important compounds for preventing heart disease, cancer, diabetes, or involved with obesity. They may have some immunomodulating effects. Your gut bacteria feed on these compounds like some of the other flavonoids and have positive effects. So in general, you just want to eat lots of these different flavonoid compounds, okay? Uh, another thing that some of these guys do is they have an anti-adherence effect. So 
some of the benefits of cranberries and elderberries. They're used to help prevent certain infections like cranberries urinary tract infections or uh, elderberries are beneficial for respiratory tract infections. The way that they exert their influence on in the body is a few different ways, but one of the ways is that they can stick to the feet of the bacteria and prevent them from adhering to your mucous membranes. So they're not directly killing the bugs, but indirectly they're not allowing them allowing these bacteria or viruses to attach to your body. And for most of these, in order to infect you, they have to attach. So if you plug up all their uh, adhesins, which are like the little suction cups that they use to stick on you, uh, you're able to flush them out of the body easier. Now, one last thing is, unlike the other flavonoids, uh, fla these anthocyanidins, because of that parasitic charge, I think it allows them to form polymers. And so they can often form what are called illegal meric polyanthocyanidins or polymers of anthocyanidins. And as a result, um, you get these very, very large molecules that kind of stick together. And these are called um, uh, non hydrolyzable tannins. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So, again, if you change the acidity of the liquid that contains these uh, anthocyanidins, they'll change red as acidic and then little more neutral sort of in this purple to blue range and then it becomes more alkalinized uh, and changes the color once you get over here okay so you can use anthocyan anthocyanidins as like a litmus test for a change checking the, uh, the ph of a solution so again the red color in blood oranges the uh, nice red color in apples uh, especially red and delicious are going to be rich in these compounds as well so we're going to finish there. So we completed all the categories on the flavonoids and some of the other polyphenols, but we still have more to cover next week. Do you guys have any questions? Went over a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, can you guys confirm that you saw the exam questions? They're posted. I'll try to post this lecture in the next uh, 20 to 4 to 48 hours. Uh, if you have any questions, just email them to me and let me know. Okay. Again, sorry for the uh, delay this morning. Uh, I learned a new thing about uh, setting up these uh, remote lectures. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Good luck, guys. We'll see you in a week. Bye for now.